Good afternoon, this is Quintus Curtius, and welcome back to the podcast. It's been a while since I've done a podcast here, and I wanted to do one here on Saturday just to let you know what's been going on recently. I've been reading this very, very good biography of Joseph Stalin, the Soviet dictator. Very, very good book. One of the best biographies I've read in years, probably, and I highly recommend it. The uh, the name of the and I've got it right here beside me. The name of the uh, the book is Stalin. Stalin and the author is Stephen Kotkin, and I'll put a link to the Amazon purchase information for this book uh, in this podcast uh, post. But it's incredible. It's an incredible book. It's with the index. It's over nine hundred pages, and this is only the first volume. From what I understand, the author is planning on doing a a three volume series. This takes the life of Stalin from his birth and origins up until 1928. And if this is only nine, if this is already 900 pages, you can imagine what the other two volumes are going to be. It's going to be a veritable encyclopedia of Stalin. And this is good because to do a proper biography, you really have to put the subject in his historical context. And that really is what the strength of this biography is the the author and i've i've read a few biography i've read a few biographies of stalin i think people should learn about him he's one of the pivotal figures of 20th century history whether you like him or not it doesn't really matter no one can deny that he's been very very influential in world history and i just like to read biographies of famous people i like to learn about what they do, how they do things, how they came to become what they were. It's very revealing. And I've written a lot about that in my own books, how the the study of men's lives can serve as illumination for our own conduct and our own lives. But what's really great about this biography is he explains the historic context behind Stalin, why he was what he was, why he did what he did, how he was a product of his times. Because some of the other biographers don't really get into this. All they do is say, okay, well, he did this on this date, he did that on some other date. But you don't really understand. You don't really get a feel for why the subject did what he did or why he wanted to do what he he wanted to do. So this is an incredible achievement, and I highly recommend it. And what I wanted to talk a little bit about in this podcast was some of the author's observations on the origins of the First World War. Now, you might not expect that in a biography of Stalin, you would find a very, very perceptive and very relevant disquisition on the origins of the First World War. But there is one in this book. It's so good, in fact, that I wanted to just summarize it and comment on it because it has so much relevance for our our own day and the political events of of our own time. And you may think, oh, well, I've heard it all before. And it's true. The origins of the First World War as a subject has been written about ad nauseam over and over again. But there's always something new to learn. There's always something new to probe into and to go over. So you can never really get enough of this stuff because... Every few years, every decade or so, you have to reinterpret things. You have to plumb the depths of the events and see what lessons we can extract for the modern era. Because perceptions of history change over time. They change with every generation. They change with every decade. Sometimes they change every few years. So we have to be aware of this. So that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to just talk a little bit about the origins of the First World War and show their relevance as to how these events link men and fortune to the great events of our time. Something that Bismarck, Otto von Bismarck, called the Iron Dice, the Iron Dice. I think what we can do at first is sort of summarize the various positions of the major belligerents at that time. Great Britain, Germany, Russia. These were the major belligerents. Italy, France, not so much. Those countries did more reacting than they did acting. But there's a great quote here in the book, and it's by uh, Lev Tikhomirov, a Russian conservative theorist in 1911. 
And he says this, he says, As a rule, a regime perishes not because of the strength of its enemies, but because of the uselessness of its defenders. And this is true. You know, I was just watching a, a Netflix series on the history of Cuba, and it talked about how Fidel Castro's revolution, his July 26th movement, overthrew the government of uh, Fulgencio Batista. And it's it's incredible about how the rev- the, the, Cuba, the uh, uh, Castro's revolution won not so much because of its military prowess, but because no one was there to defend the dictatorship of Batista. In any case, let's uh, talk a little bit about the First World War here. You know, let's start first with a little bit about Germany. And Germany before the first world, the First World War was an incredibly powerful country in so many different uh, areas, intellectually, uh, industrially, militarily, economically. You know, you can just feel it. If you read the books of that era, of the pre-World War I era, you can't but help notice that so much of the great scholarship was done by Germans. You know, I'm, uh, I'm very interested as readers, or as listeners may know, in classical scholarship. And it's hard to escape notice that so many of the great classical editing and translations and works uh, were done uh, by the Germans in the early part of the 20th century. In the chemical industry, they were unraveled. In the sciences, physics, chemistry, um, electrics, it's, it just the list goes on and on and on. Germany was just a very, very powerful, very imposing country. And this scared a lot of the powers that existed at that time, especially Great Britain, especially Great Britain. And some of the exacerbating factors really were the fact that Germany did not have what I would call the best leadership in the Kaiser, Kaiser Wilhelm II. You know, it says here in the book that in 1910, American President uh, Theodore Roosevelt, he met the Kaiser. Uh, At that time, he was the the former president. And he told his wife, he said, I'm absolutely certain now we're all in for it. So he could tell that this guy was not a very good leader. He was not a very good, you know, the, the Kaiser, he was not an evil man. But he was an arrogant man, and he was an insecure man. And those two things make for a very, very dangerous combination. Being arrogant and being insecure, those two things are very dangerous. I mean, either one is bad enough. But when you combine them together, you have a potential recipe for disaster. And that's what happened. That's what happened in the case of of Germany. And he just started out on a bad note. He dismissed his longtime Prime Minister Otto von Bismarck, who was a brilliant man, uh, someone who, if he had li- if he had been around, he probably would have been able to keep the peace and restrain some of the worst impulses of the crown, but he was dismissed. And the Kaiser himself took charge of Germany's foreign policy and then single-handedly proceeded to ruin everything. Uh, Bismarck was focused on sort of a rapprochement with Russia, with a, with a, um, uh, you know, a, a reinsurance. Uh, uh, Bismarck had entered something called a German-Russian reinsurance treaty, and the Kaiser abrogated that treaty, and by doing so spurred French-Russian reconciliation and the prospect of a two-front war. Uh, he also did some other things that I think were just very, very Unproductive. He unleashed a, a 60 battleship fantasy program for the North Sea, which aroused the suspicions of the British. And I mean, Bismarck himself said, he said, the Kaiser was like a balloon. He said, if you, if you don't hold on to the string, if you don't keep a firm grip on the string, you never know where it's going to float off to. And this is, uh, this is really the paradox. He says, you know, alliances themselves never really cause wars. It's calculation and, and miscalculation that cause wars. And it's also emotions. It's also fears. You know, Thucydides uh, said in his own history of the Peloponnesian War, he said it was the rise of Athens and the fear that inspired uh, 
It was the rise of Athens and the fear that this inspired in Sparta that made war inevitable. So it was perceptions, maybe not necessarily reality, that were critical in triggering belligerents to go to war. And this really happened in the First World War. And, you know, besides the imprudent leadership of the Kaiser, the German general staff also had certain fixations that proved to be very, very blinding. The uh, top military brass in Germany were fixated on this supposed Russian threat to Europe. And, uh, you know, despite all evidence to the contrary, Russian, Russia's steel production in 1914 was no more than 25% of Germany's. And, um, you know, German military planners, though, were obsessed about the potentially huge population issues coming out of Russia and the potential that the Russians might be able to bring to bear a huge army that could pose a threat to Eastern Europe. So they had this idea that if we wait any longer, if we wait, the, the German chief of general staff, uh, von Moltke, the younger, had said, if we wait any longer, we might diminish our chances. It's impossible to compete with Russia with regards to quantity. So this was the thinking. They were just obsessed with what was happening in the East. And then to make things worse, the Germans compensated for these feelings of encirclement by proposing to deal with it with essentially a defensive strategy that entailed conquering all of Europe. Instead of hammering out a, a defensive strategy that might have made sense, they had this Schlieffen plan obsession, which involved essentially destroying France first in the West and then turning on the Russians, which we can argue whether that made sense or not. But, you know, it's hard to separate defense from offense in this sort of plan. So it was their overreactions, their obsessions, their overreactions, which helped make escalation once a crisis started inevitable. And, and Bismarck had, had predicted this. In, 18, in 1888, he had predicted that, the, that a general European war could start over what he called some damn foolish thing in the Balkans. He said this in 1888, and he turned out to be right. But there were other players. I don't, I don't want to give the impression that it was Germany's fault. Uh, the nature of the German leadership was a contributing factor. But I think just as important were the Russians, the actions of the Russians, and the actions of Great Britain. You know, when, when we look at Great Britain, we can't but fail to see just how bad the leadership was at that time. I mean, Britain was a world power. It was a true global power. It was the global power. And they wished to impose a Pax Britannica on the world. But they lacked the leadership, and they lacked really the conviction to really do that in a way that made sense. The British had always been uh, even before the days of Napoleon, they had always been suspicious of the European continent coming under the control of just one power. And they did everything they could to prevent this. That was part of their strategy. The British have never really liked the prospect of participating in continental events in Europe uh, up until the present day. And we could almost interpret maybe the Brexit vote as some continuation of this ancient British reluctance to really play a role in what goes on in Europe. I mean, every, when Napoleon tried to bring the whole continent under his control, the British resisted that. When it looked like Germany under the Kaiser might become the predominant European power, they resisted that, and they did everything they could to thwart that. And they did the same thing, obviously, in the Second World War, obviously. So this this is... And this is understandable. This is this is understandable. What But what made the British a um, uh, contributing factor in the start of the First World War was that they just lacked uh, Edward Gray and his uh, prime ministers that came before and after him simply lacked the, the ability, the crisis management ability, the statesmanship to really act as the, the inter intermediaries, intermediaries that they should have acted as to prevent a localized crisis like what happened like what happened in the Balkans from spiraling out of control. You know, the British also had a plan to try to ruin uh, Germany economically 
by manipulating the world financial system in the event of war. But, you know, besides these preventative measures, the British never really had and never really desired to have a system set up that could internationally arbitrate disputes and prevent them from getting out of control. I mean, they wanted all the benefits of being the world's imperialist power, but really none of the responsibilities that went along with doing that. So that once things started to become out of, just once things started to get out of control in Europe, they just floundered around stupidly. I mean, that's really what emerges in the crisis of 1914 is just the complete ineptitude of the British to really try to do anything to prevent the belligerents from going all in with both feet. Now, from the perspective of Russia, Russia's problem was its complete the the complete ineptitude of its political leadership. Nicholas II was a weak-willed, manipulative man, really incapable of doing anything uh, except maybe minding a candy store in his life. Uh, a, a real mediocrity of a man, a really useless individual. Uh, he schemed. He was. He he schemed against his own ministers. He schemed against his own Duma. He undermined his own uh, officials. And it really was the Russians' complete lack of restraint once the crisis in the Balkans erupted that allowed things to get out of control. The Russians saw in the opportunity for war, or the Russian leadership rather saw in the opportunity for war the chance to solve all of their internal problems. Uh, since the beginning of the 20th century, Russia had been, had been a creaking, teetering giant uh, that was modern in some ways, but feudal in other ways. And this uh, rickety feudal system, czarist system that existed, could not endure for long. It was already bankrupt by the time of the First World War. It only needed a kick in the door for the whole rotten thing to come crashing down. And a lot of the Russian leadership knew this. They knew that they would not survive the war. They knew that their system was not strong enough to hold up under the inevitable strains of war. And, you know, in this respect, it's worth quoting. There's a great quote here in this book by, and I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, Pyotr uh, Drnovo. Pyotr Drnovo. And he sent a memorandum to Nicholas II in February 1914 regarding the consequences of a possible war with Germany. And this is what his memo said. And listen to this for prescience, for predictability. He says, The trouble will start with the blaming of the government for all disasters. In the legislative institutions, a bitter campaign against the government will begin, followed by revolutionary agitation throughout the country, with socialist slogans capable of arousing and rallying the masses, beginning with a beginning with the division of land and succeeded by a division of all valuables and property. The defeated army, having lost its most dependable men and carried away by the tide of primitive peasant desire for land, will find itself too demoralized to serve as a bulwark of law and order. The legislative institutions and the, and the intellectual opposition will be powerless to stem the popular tide aroused by themselves. And this was said in February 1914 by Pyotr Dornovo, who I guess was a minister of the Tsarist court. Incredibly predictive statement, all of which predictions turned out to be true when the Russian state collapsed in 1917. So the Russians had a lot of problems. And they thought that they could take advantage of a general war. I should say the, the, uh, the Tsar thought that he could take advantage of the crisis in the Balkans to somehow uh, bolster his own regime, to somehow solve all of his problems. And, you know, you can't use war to solve your problems. You can't use war, external wars of aggression, to solve your own problems. You just can't. Look at the United States. It thought it could... Uh, initiate wars of aggression in the Middle East and elsewhere, and that somehow these would solve all of its uh, internal problems, and they, they, they don't. They make it worse. So the Russians were the first ones to generally mobilize, and of course, once they did that, that triggered a German general mobilization, and then from there, war was on. 
But it's just very tragic that even the last-minute attempts to bring the countries back from the brink, there were some belated last-minute efforts by the British. Uh, you know, a six-minute conversation between the British ambassador and the German ambassador failed to produce anything in meaningful in the way of results. But this is what happens when you have stupid idiots, when you have complete idiots uh, running the show who have no comprehension of what they're doing. And you know, Kotkin here sums up everything. The author Kotkin sums up everything, which I'll read from his book when he's talking about the motivations and the reasons for the outbreak of the First World War. He says, um, World War looks inexorable. Over decades, Imperial German ruling circles had lacked elementary circumspection about their newfound might. Imperial, imperialist Britain lacked the visionary, skilled, skillful leadership needed to accept and thereby temper Germany's power. Elements in Serbia plotted murder with disregard for the consequences. Austria-Hungary, bereft of its heir, opted for an existential showdown. German ruling circles looked to shore up their one ally, a beleaguered Austria, while being fundamentally insecure about an inability to win the arms race against the great powers on either side of Germany, especially with the growing military prowess of a weak Russia, and therefore developed a defensive plan that entailed the conquest of Europe. Russia risked everything, not over a dubious pan-Slavic interest in Serbia, but over what a failure to defend Serbia would do to Russia's prestige. And finally, Britain and Germany tried but failed to collude in a last-minute bilateral deal at Russia's expense. The thought would persist. As if all that was not sufficient cause, it was summertime, Chief of Staff von Moltke was on a four-week holiday in Karlsbad until July 25th, his second extended spa visit that summer for liver disease. German Grand Admiral Alfred von Tirpitz was at a spa in Switzerland. The chief of the Austro-Hungarian staff, Field Marshal Baron Franz Konrad von Hotzendorf, was in the Alps with his mistress, and both the German and Austrian war ministers were on holiday as well. Additional structural factors, an overestimation of the military offensive, also weighed heavily in the march toward Armageddon. So this is what happens when you have miscalculation on top of miscalculation on top of miscalculation. It ends in a complete disaster. And I wanted to make a podcast about this because this type of subject never loses, never loses its relevancy. It never loses its resonance for us in our own personal lives and for us in contemporary politics. We must always be mindful of the fact that weak-willed leaders, leaders who are arrogant or stupid or both, can contribute to the hurling of their own countries toward Armageddon. And the same thing is true in, in personal lives, in the lives of individuals, in the lives of of families, businesses, and other organizations. We have to always be mindful of the consequences of our actions. We have to think. We have to think. Not wishfully think, but think of the consequences in cold, hard, rational ways. Because conflict is a serious course of action, and we can never expect, we can never hope, that embarking on one serious course will somehow solve our own problems. We cannot use conflict. We cannot use uh, troublesome courses of action to solve our own problems. We can't do that. And I think that, more than anything else, is the lesson about the origins of the First World War. In any case... I'm almost done with this uh, Stalin biography, and I'll maybe give more of a report on that when I'm done with it. But until then, let's uh, reflect on these things. I'm Quintus Curtius. Good night. <laughs>